Um, we're going to hit chapter 6 and into 7 of Acts, and uh, I'd like to start with prayer. Our Father and our God, in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, we come before thy throne this day. We've come gathering to worship, to honor you, to show you that we desire to be more like you and to do what you would have us to do. We pray that this class and that the service to follow will be edifying and beneficial to that end. And may we walk as though uh, we have been uh, in communion and in contact with you. Help us, Heavenly Father, to uh, be understanding, to be concerned, to be discerning. And we pray these favors and blessings in the name of thy son, Jesus. Amen. All right. What I'd like to do is um, Acts 6. I'd like somebody to read uh, the first seven verses. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This one works. Okay, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their windows were... Pardon me, their widows, the windows in my house are neglected. That's, I was yeah. noticing that today. They're a little dirty. But anyway, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Thank you. Now, I don't know where you get, you get stuck on this and start, your mind starts wandering and thinking about, wow, something's going on here. But did anybody notice in chapter 1, or I mean verse 1, it says there was a murmuring. And then in chapter, in verse 2, the, the 12 called the multitude of disciples together. It seems to me that for all that the apostles had to do in their ministry, they noticed there was a problem. And what do they do? They fixed it. They didn't let it fester. They didn't let it continue. They didn't let it spread or cause more uh, dissension or trouble. And I'm not really certain, and you, don't, you can speak up anytime you want to on this, but I wondered if uh, this wasn't a us versus them mentality. These were the Grecians, and they were talking about the Hebrews. And the Hebrews had this kind of an outlook on life as if everything centered around them. And then here comes the Grecians, and they're complaining. So 
I didn't know if this was a complaint because of the separation or other things. Ann? Their widows, yes, the Greek widows is the way I took it. Yeah. And the, in the Hebrews, there, there wasn't probably taking care of them, themselves first and then left over, and who got around to taking care of the Greeks anyway? I mean, I don't know that. I, I didn't, but that just seemed to jump out at me. The other thing that jumped out at me was that the apostles uh, took after the problem. And I believe that's what we all should be doing rather than sitting around and letting these things continue. But let's do something about it. And then what did they do? They did it. They, well, they did it, yeah. Seven, say two seven, you know, two seven. That, yeah, well, it didn't matter. You could jump in, like I said, anytime. I'm, I'm just one individual, but it's, it seems to me that they, they knew a plan. And I, I kind of get the idea that the apostles had some kind of discernment and wisdom in things. And then it was uh, select seven men. Yeah, Andy? Well, and what struck me in that is this full of the Holy Ghost. That's, that's an interesting thing to me. I mean, I've think I've experienced the Holy Ghost. I don't know that I would claim I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I, you know, they didn't ask for seven volunteers either. They asked, hey, you people select seven honest men, which is basically saying, y'all select seven guys you trust that you will take their word and not be bickering with them either. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's a lot here, I guess, to add to that we're making, taking for granted maybe, but, but yeah, I'd, I'd say that that being full of the Holy Ghost, and then what did it also say? Wisdom or something? Wisdom, yep. It, yeah, it, well, that's interesting, but, you know, that can be a subjective item <clears throat> so but but I, to me what they're saying is okay you pick seven guys you trust and then we're gonna we'll take care of this sherry good good point what he's had a But uh, I uh, also look at uh, verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So it wasn't something that just a one day, one occurrence thing. But it was the admonishment of the, uh, you know, the apostles that, hey, guys, this is what it's going to take. Continually in prayer, continually abiding in the Holy Spirit. And also, but searching the wisdom and the word for truth. It, it, Jim? Is it worthwhile to question what? Uh, is it worthwhile to mess around with the question what office and calling were they called to? I don't get it. I don't, I don't see an indication there. Well, there and is, what were their specific duties? Well, when you look at the idea of, I don't know if there's any indication. I do think that Stephen probably was a a priest, because later on you'll f find out, or uh, Philip was, and Stephen may have been, but the baptism of the eunuch, he didn't confer the Holy Ghost on him, but that he was laid down into the water. So that could either mean that he, uh, he did it and they didn't record it, or he didn't do it because he didn't have authority to. And I don't know which, but I've sort of, on my own, taken him to be of the Aaronic priesthood. The other thing is, this is a tangible ministry that they are called to. 
who in the church today has this kind of a tangible ministry? And I believe this is kind of a pattern for it. And, and like Sherry said, it was important. It's important to take care of the widows. And the, the seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, it demonstrates that the apostles felt the same way, that it was important to have these men that are in charge that are worthy of uh, our, our allegiance. Would he? Yes, that that is. I, I'd agree with that. And I don't know, Jim, if you had other insight, but I don't. I didn't. I don't have any particular uh, understanding any more than other people. I haven't looked that through up not all the way through, but I think it was important. It I'll was muddy. Impo I'll muddy the water. I don't know that they have to be priesthood. That's I, I mean, I understand our background and where we mm -hmm. come from and trying to assign responsibility and duty, you know, and, and it talks about the come and verse, the end of verse seven, it talks about the company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Okay. So, and I'm not saying they're not priesthood. I'm just saying they started out, they said, set, pick seven men mm -hmm. that you trust. I mean, I'm using my word, seven men that you trust. It didn't say pick seven priests, deacons, teachers whatever it says pick seven men you trust and then we're going from there are you are you saying that a man that's not in the priesthood could be filled with the holy ghost and full of wisdom absolutely okay. i i could agree and i i don't i don't we naturally gravitate toward priesthood ministry but this was an important ministry to be offered because there probably were a lot of widows Well, and, and um, you know, with our understanding, uh, by their fruits, you shall know them. So, I mean, just because, and, and again, this goes back to what Andy's saying, you know, by, they're already serving in their office and calling under the Holy Spirit will lead them. And they'll reach out because they're doing things of their own accord, not being wait to be told what to do but they're doing them of their own accord, led by the Holy Spirit because of the continuing in prayer and studying with the Lord. And I, I think that's a good thing. It was, it was a challenge. And, and to what kind of ministry then were they ordained? A tangible ministry, one that's necessary, but then that's not really all, all that well known. Uh, the apostles, everybody seems to know who the apostles are and the higher priesthood authorities and uh, the men that do the work. I, I remember growing up uh, when I was working, when I was a counselor at youth camps, the last Saturday was always the day everybody, everybody wanted to have time hugging each other and saying goodbye and stuff. But the ladies in the kitchen were trying to lock up and they needed help. And there weren't hardly anybody that was willing to offer to mop the floor or to put away stuff or to take care of the final things that these ladies had sacrificed throughout the whole week to provide. And then, and I don't think it was because they're selfish. I just think they, they didn't understand. But this was something that, that could be offered back to them. And it was always difficult to get people to do that kind of thing. Two, going back to the priesthood question, I think, just a second, that we could at least rest assured that two of them had priesthood authority. Stephen, by virtue of his application before the, the, the council, and then Philip, due to the opportunity to baptize, and we know that, the, that Philip, for sure, at least held the, the office of priest. Steve? Uh, I don't know. Statement about Stephen because um, it said he was full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. It doesn't say he was full of faith and the gifts of the Spirit, which the gifts of the Spirit we all have. Uh, power, I think, is a different thing. Um, and I think that probably is reserved for priesthood. Um, and I don't know, but I'm just saying because it uses the word power. Um, and how is that, I mean, if you, 
if you heal somebody with power, if you heal somebody with the gift of the Spirit, is it different? I don't know. But he was given power. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps well, the gift, magnify the gift, and then you have something more for it. Anne? I think another lesson for us in this is if, if the Grecians were complaining to the Hebrews because their own widows weren't being taken care of, the Grecian widows, then apparently the Hebrews extended care to others than their own. And maybe they kind of dropped the ball there for a little bit. But I think that's a lesson to us, too, to not just care about ourselves, but to care about those out, outside our own group. That's such a powerful statement, to not care about ourselves. You look at the lives of the apostles. How did they get to do what they did? Is that they did not care about their own person. They cared about the work. Could I add to what I said? And I don't know if I'm Sharing going off on a tangent. Can he add what he, can, okay. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, the gifts of the spirit, um, you don't always have them. I mean, they're there, they're at your disposal, but you have them when God, the Holy Spirit wants to give them to you. Uh, so if you, if, if the Lord wants somebody healed and you're there to do it, he'll give you that gift. I think power is pretty much there the whole time. So, anyway. Sherry? Sherry. I didn't really realize it when Andy read that, but they brought them before the apostles. They didn't just give them the job. They laid hands on them, so they set them apart. That's a very good point, and I think that's a, a, a very, very important that the apostles, even though this ministry wasn't for them, this ministry was very important that they would be set aside particularly to do this ministry. Yeah, and that could have been ordaining them, setting them apart, or, or, or whatever. The, the comment I wanted to make was I find it interesting that there seems to be this structure going on within the scriptures, but it's never just been flat laid out that this is when we did it, this was how it was done. You know, there's this, it appears to be this evolution of structure happening after Jesus' ascension. There's no record of what did he tell these guys before he left, this is what I want you to do or this is how it goes. It's, there's just all this, it shows up. Okay, good, good, go ahead. One story I wanted to tell is Josh, went, our son went to Kenya and he and Tyler were supposed to teach class to kids. He gets there and they changed it to young marrieds, which they weren't married, how they teach a class. You know, it just, it was a shock to them. And then they ended up with widows. So that was their teaching was to the widows. And he said when they got done, the widows assembled and they ranted and raved at the priesthood because they weren't taking care of them. And Josh said, funny thing, he said, I understood what they were saying in, in their language. So he received a blessing feeling like it was opened up to him. But, you know, the widows realized that they should be being taken care of. And they usually are pretty good from what I hear of some of their structure. But that day they were not happy. And it, it was, it was, it's probably good to point out that, that uh, Tyler and Josh at the time, both of them were priests. Well, no, Tyler was a deacon. And um, it was a, a ministry that they were offering because it needed to be offered. And, and there's power there when you're operating and doing things for the Lord and you see beyond yourself. And that's one of the things that we have failed to grasp. We, we look back and we just enjoy the stories from the Bible, but we don't realize that those stories that happened to them could be ours if we did some of the same things. And uh, I, I'm getting a ringing grant. I don't know if you could... Oh, okay, I'm sorry, didn't, and um, I thought the laying on a hands deal was very important. You know, in our history, Emma Smith was set aside, set apart, laying on a hands. I don't, I, it was an ordination, but it, but it was maybe to a particular thing. I, I'm not really certain. But again, I, I've been through, and I'm sure you've all been there, that we've, we've had dinners or things at churches where we've had to set up tables and 
the, the, the higher ups stood around watching while the, the, all the other people went around setting up and taking down and you know packing around things. And sometimes, uh, I, I often wonder if they got that from here. Now that's not every place, Woody, but it, it is places that I have been. There was a pastor that would not do, that at a branch where I was, that wouldn't do anything in the way of helping physically set up things but he was always busy talking, and that, that, may, that has its ministry too. Okay, so here we are. Um, the word of God increased, and that's a, that's a powerful statement. The word of God increased. Now, how do you suppose the word of God increased? What are they talking about? That, that there's more words that are thrown out there? Or like the scriptures say, they became living words or living epistles? <clears throat> Jesus is the word. That's what it says in John, right? Mm -hmm. So if the word of God increased, what's Jesus increased? The knowledge of Jesus increased. The response to Jesus increased. The teachings of Jesus were adhered to. We're, we're tried to follow greater. I mean, if I guess that's one direction. Jesus is the word. Jesus increased, whatever that means, however you look at that. I, you know, I like that direction, too, by the way. I think that, that uh, there's a power. There's a power in the name, and, and it increased within him. I think, too, that within these people, when they were seeing these things, they were a part of it. You know, one of the biggest faults that, uh, was pointed out about the Protestant religion back in the 1830s is that they didn't believe that miracles and things like this could happen. And Joseph Leff pointed out, he says, they believed that the modern Christian could only enjoy reading about the, the, the buffet that the early Christians enjoyed the feasts that they had with the spirit, but that was no longer possible. So the God who never changes put Christians in a place where they would never be able to experience for themselves his power. And that was what was being taught in the early church or in the, in, in the churches of the 1830. Now, Two things, widows. There's probably a lot of widows there. Why would there be a lot of widows that would be following or joining with this group of people? Why would there be a lot of widows in the early church? First century. Oh, well, there was a lot of, I mean, Saul put a few guys to death for being believers. Didn't say he put their wives to death for being a believer, but he put they put the men to death for being believers. And, and what if you were a widow, like you know those those cooks at the camp? They worked all week and worked hard. They were up early and stayed up late, and it was difficult for them. And they sacrificed all this stuff. And the widows had raised families, had sacrificed, and now their husbands are gone. And who's there to take care of them? And then you got this body of believers that say we love all people and let us show tangible means of, of support. Where would you go? Why wouldn't you go to a group like that? And especially if that group showed that they were willing to offer the ministry that, that those people were needing. And another thing I was thinking is um, a lot of us get caught up in form over substance. And we believe, in, in, you know, like with the, the, whether these guys were priesthood or not, I, I'm not really certain. I think it's important. The priesthood has its place. But the fact that there are non-priesthood that can offer ministry of a very valuable and insightful as, assistance to people should tell us something about the magnanimous uh, nature of God's spirit. It should encourage us. So uh, that's enough about that. I'll, I'll leave that. But I think it was important that the word of God increased. And coincidentally, 
as the word of God increased, what else increased? The numbers of disciples. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And you know, the real sad thing about all of this for today is that we see this and we see what happened to them. And in, this, in that vision, we're kind of condemning ourselves because we aren't there. So are we a disciple or are we a member? That's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of assumption made, I mean, in all different kinds of directions. But am I a disciple or am I just on the rolls? You know, that's, that's interesting. I told you that story. I was up at a reunion and I baptized, uh, or I mean, I, I confirmed two people. One of them was baptized by a, uh, a, re a remnant person. And another one was baptized by a, uh, uh, a restoration person, but they were confirmed by a remnant person. And the first words out of somebody's mouth after we got back home was, well, who gets the credit? Where, whose church are they like? I said, how about the Church of Jesus Christ? You know? And, and, and it, that's one of those things that we fight over. You're, you're absolutely right. Steve. He asked her. <laughs> she said, well, I want to be a member of the people that were in that church. And that took care of it. So. It's exactly right. And we've kind of missed it, haven't we? When we, we when you, you ever go back through the, the baptismal prayer? And, and who's got a Doctrine and Covenants? You can find that in section 17. But it talks about the prayer, but nowhere in the prayer does it say, you become a member of the reorganized church or the restoration church or the community of Christ church. It's a member of Christ's church. You are now into the body of Christ. That's a very pertinent point. And comparing the baptism and the widows, why would they choose what they choose, but because they see the love in, that is demonstrated to them. So that's, you know, when Linda got baptized, Who's she going to choose but the people that have cared for her? You know, if good, you just want them point. to be uh, on your rolls, whoop de do. I mean, yeah, the, being your, having your name on the rolls is not going to guarantee a place in, in the court of heaven. Okay, now it says a great company of priests were obedient. And in my mind, I don't know about you, but in my mind, the idea, did anybody find section 17 in the, the baptismal prayer? If you do, just raise your hand. You got it? No, I can go back to it. Yeah, I, I'm... I don't. I, I just, again, we talk form over substance. I'm not really certain. I just look at the Doctrine and Covenants being the last word on it. Andy? Having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Read that again, please. Having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And Steve, you were saying the Book of Mormon, which says yeah. having been given authority. Okay. So if you're commissioned and you have authority, it's it, actually it's synonymous. Give me a, give me a, give me a minute. I'll Okay, but in that prayer that was read twice in the last few in the last few seconds, where did you hear church? And, and and there's one of those assumptions that we have made throughout the years, that you're baptized and and I've done that and and met, called the name of the church and I felt really good about doing it, but it wasn't necessary, because when they're baptized and the hands of the elders are laid on the heads of the people. They're given the gift of the Holy Ghost, which automatically puts them in the Church of Jesus Christ. All right, Andy. Well, I'm trying to get it. I'm in the neighborhood here, but the hot button for me here is baptism with fire and the Holy Ghost. John 
It says, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming that baptizes you with the fire and the Holy Ghost. John didn't say there's one coming to confirm you a member of his church. And so, <clears throat> hot button for me is I'm not sure we're supposed to be confirming anybody. I think we're supposed to be baptizing them with the fire and the Holy Ghost. And, but that, that's my hot button, and I saw I'm not prepared to pursue it today, yeah. but just my two cents into that. That's all right. Two cents, they add up, you know, keep adding them. Yeah, the, the conferring. But I, I went back to the, the Hebrew priests, the Jewish priests, and they were among the most obstinate and stubborn people. And I don't know if these guys are the ones that came out of that or these people were priests that were called, but there was a power and it was noted enough. You know, it's interesting how many things are not said. Well, it was noted sufficiently among those that were before Luke, a great company of priests were obedient. And that's powerful. That's a very good point. Yes, not all, but a great company. I remember writing a letter to an apostle early on when I was a kid. You know how you connect to somebody that's important, and I was, I was had kind of uh, cut loose. My dad had died. I was on my own somewhat, but I wrote a letter and asked him about it. I said I'd heard a lot of, I'd heard that the apostles were no longer having a, bearing a witness of the Book of Mormon, and along those very same lines, he says, I and many of my brethren continue to bear witness of the Book of Mormon as a, a book of divinity, a, a divine book. Now, what's it say? You know, that, that, that says a lot. Can I say it? Is it going to hurt people? Well, maybe I better not. I'll tell you afterwards. But I always thought he was a good guy. He did have big feet. I want you to know that. So, that, all right. And then, then it goes on. Let's see. Um, let's read eight to fifteen, eight to the end of the chapter. End of chapter. Go ahead, Annie. And Stephen, full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people. And there arose certain of the synagogue who are called Libertines and also Cyrenians and Alexandrians and them of Sicilia and of Asia disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, and the elders, and the scribes, and came upon him, and caught him, and brought him to the council, and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as if it had been the face of an angel. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, I, I want to go back through a few things. Number one is suborn. Do you know what suborn means? Jim? Not looking it up, I had assumed it meant subordinated, but I'm not sure now. Well, yeah, it, it, it probably is um, it, that in a deeper sense. Suborn means to encourage somebody to lie. So, no, you aren't, because you're you're creating you're 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 saying that suborning suborning subordinating the truth to the lie. 
So uh, suborning perjury is you're encouraging somebody to tell a lie. And here these people, <laughs> I love it. You know, the minute we open our mouths and put, our, put our, our words out there that are so strong and hard and steadfast, we, we find ourselves getting hammered with those very words. Here they are. We heard him blaspheming Moses and God. And yet, what are they doing? They're encouraging people to lie to to accuse this guy. Now, do you know, uh, I've done some search on this. Uh, sometimes I'm way ahead of myself, but this one I happened to, I had done some research. Do you know one of the critical issues that we don't even talk about here is that in the Hebrew law, anybody that brings false testimony that leads to the death of the, the uh, what do you call it, the vi the, not the victim, but the, the object of the of the trial, they themselves are put to death when it's found out. So to suborn perjury is not such an easy offense. It's an offense punishable by death because you lied and that lie precipitated the death of another. And they knew it. And yet they're condemning Stephen, and they condemn Jesus. This is another one of those, Peter, you know, Jesus, the Son of God, whom you crucified. You know, how many times have we heard that? This is another one of those where we're actually seeing the hypocrisy, and not only the hypocrisy, but the devilish nature. They did not care for that which they said they cared for. They cared for their own goals, which is totally an antithesis to the Christian walk in life. When I'm walking down the street and I see a person that's, that's needy, if I turn my head, I'm not doing what the Lord did. I'm not, I'm not asking, you know, I'm not asking for that man's salvation. I'm, I'm fighting against it. We should be aware of those who are dressed like us that have trouble and be willing to help them to reach out and touch their lives. Another thing is, um, uh, they, were, they were certain of the synagogue. Now they went on and mentioned libertines. Now this, is, this is, gets a little scholarly, I guess, but libertines are Jews, and this is according to a guy named Philo, and I, I'm, he was a historian, who had been made captives of the Romans under Pompey, but were afterwards set free who, although they had fixed their abode in Rome, had built their own, ex at their own expense, a synagogue in Jerusalem, which they, when they frequented that city. So look at us. Look at us. We're wealthy. We got our own synagogues. We don't have to worship, worship with the poor people. The name Libertines adhered to them to distinguish them from freeborn Jews who had subsequently taken up residence in Rome. Evidence seems to have been discovered of the existence of a synagogue of libertines at Pompeii. So what I'm thinking is happening here is that even, even in their own, God's not going to come back and pluck these people out. Why do we have the difficulties we have? Why do we face what we face? If, if God is a good parent, many people argue, why would he allow death? But God says, as a father pities his own children, so I pity those who are my children. I'm, 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 I'm merciful and gracious to them if they listen. Anyway, that's one thing. That, then they mentioned the Cyrenians. Now, of course, that would be somebody that's a native of Cyrene. Big deal. But you remember the name of Cyrene somewhere else in the scriptures? Go to Matthew 27, 34. Please, I don't mean to sound heavy-handed. It's time to quit. Yeah, but go. did you have something, Andy? Go ahead. I did find the Book of Mormon baptismal prayer, uh, Third Nephi chapter five, verse twenty-five. Having authority given me of Jesus Christ, 
I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Having authority, having been commissioned. Anybody find any, thank you. Uh, anybody find anything about the, the uh, Matthew twenty seven thirty four? What is it? Matthew twenty seven thirty four. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. So insignificant, right? But it's significant enough that they're mentioned. They're called out. And the interesting thing with this is that he, he was from Cyrene, and he was there at the crucifixion. So they had those people living there, but why specifically name him? And then they talk about uh, uh, the G Cyrenian Jews were important enough to have their name associated with the synagogue in Jerusalem. So they may have been related to the Libertines. They originally were a Greek colony. They are from the city of Libya in northern Africa, a city of Lib Libya. And it, it, it was an important coastal town on the Mediterranean. It was a good seaport. And it had many commercial and agricultural advantages. Ptolemy I took the Jews and dispersed them here and to other Lib uh, Lib Libyan cities. <clears throat> And some Cyrenians converted to Jerusalem, or converted to Judaism, convert, were converted at Jerusalem. And then, <coughs> excuse me, they weren't converted to Jewish, the Hebrew. They were converted to Christianity. And then they went to Antioch to preach the word to the Jews only. And one man, by the name of Lucius, became a prophet. So I believe that Luke is aware that God loves all people and it doesn't it doesn't matter the color of your skin it doesn't matter the country from which you come and I think that was actually the reason why he wrote it it was kind of a thumb in the eye of the Jewish people who were all that they hated the Samaritans they hated anybody that wasn't like them and this is where we end up but we're going to stop there we'll come back and finish that up um, in uh, in whenever next week i guess so are you okay stop this is the first sunday in that, that i've been teaching that i was able to stop on my own and not have somebody tell me to shut up